This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. More practical manner, this bill proposes the implementation of a modern, flexible regulatory framework for the CRTC to apply fair rules to all broadcasters and make sure that it has the necessary tools to do its job effectively. We will also go a step further and we will instruct the CRTC how to use these new tools. This will happen once the bill receives royal assent, and this bill makes amendments that allow for this essential policy directive. Bill C-10, government's Broadcasting Act reform bill that has significant implications for the internet and internet regulation and has slowly been making its way through the House of Commons. It's expected that the bill will be the subject of committee hearings in the new year. And if you've taken the time to follow the debate in the House of Commons, I think it's fair to say that there hasn't been a whole lot of opposition. I suppose that shouldn't come as much surprise. Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Guibault has told the House that the bill will level the playing field, that it will establish a high revenue threshold before it applies to internet streamers, that it won't impact consumer choice or raise consumer costs. He's argued that even if you don't believe in cultural sovereignty, you should still support his bill for the economic benefits it will bring, warning at times that Canadian producers could miss out on as much as a billion dollars by 2023 if his legislation isn't enacted. In fact, he paints a picture of internet companies who are invariably called web giants that have millions of Canadian subscribers but don't contribute to the Canadian economy. For the last several weeks, I've been trying to make the case that Guibault is wrong. He's wrong in his description of the bill. It doesn't, for example, contain the economic thresholds he says that it does. He's wrong about the impact on consumers, since the bill is almost certain to decrease consumer choice and increase costs. He's wrong about the contributions of internet streamers, who have been described as the biggest contributor to Canadian production. I think he's wrong about the level playing field claims, since incumbent broadcasters enjoy a host of regulatory benefits that are not enjoyed by internet streamers. I think he's wrong about the impact of the bill from an economic perspective, since it is likely to decrease investment in the short term. And I think he's really wrong about cultural sovereignty, since on a host of issues, it actually surrenders cultural sovereignty rather than protect it. Now, the way I've been trying to express these concerns is through a blog post series that I've called the Broadcasting Act Blunder. As I record this, I've had 16 different posts expressing concern about the bill. There are a few more to come, but I wanted to use this podcast to hear a little bit about what the minister has told the House and the press, and then try to respond based largely on some of the postings that I've put online. Let's start with one of Guibault's central arguments, the claim that there is a need to create a level playing field. Here's what he had to say in the House of Commons. Madam Speaker, the purpose of the bill is to level the playing field and ensure funding for Canadian stories and Canadian talent. The claims around a level playing field have been largely taken as a given by most. But when you dig a little bit deeper, I think you find that they are at best misleading. It's true that conventional broadcasters and broadcast distributors like cable and satellite companies face mandated payments to support Canadian content as part of their licensing requirements. Even if we leave aside the fact that broadcasters are currently seeking to reduce those payments at the CRTC, the notion that the only regulatory burden or benefit is mandated Canadian content contributions is a real misread of the law. The reality is that broadcasters receive benefits that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars in return for those payments is part of what amounts to a regulatory quid pro quo. Now, none of those benefits are available to internet streaming services, yet the level the playing field discussion seems to focus exclusively on the issue of equivalent payment requirements. Now, there's a whole bunch of examples that I cite in a post on this issue. For example, there are simultaneous substitution policies, which allow Canadian broadcasters to replace foreign signals with their own. 
Canadians will be well familiar with the policy. And the industry says that it generates hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue every year for Canadian broadcasters. In fact, some may recall that Bell went to the Supreme Court to maintain the policy on a single program, the Super Bowl broadcasts, arguing that it would have disastrous effects for its bottom line. Now, there's simply no equivalent to the hundreds of millions of dollars that are generated by that policy exclusively for Canadian broadcasters for Internet streaming services. But there are a host of other examples. There are must-carry regulations where broadcast distributors include many Canadian channels on basic cable and satellite packages that guarantee access to millions of subscribers. There's nothing equivalent for internet streamers. There are copyright retransmission rules with an exemption in the Copyright Act that allow those broadcast distributors to retransmit the signals without infringing copyright. There's nothing equivalent like that for internet streamers. There's marketplace protection that have shielded Canadian broadcasters from foreign competition, such as HBO or ESPN for decades, but internet streamers have to compete every day. And if you follow the news, you know that that competition is becoming increasingly heated. There's eligibility for some Canadian funding programs that broadcasters can access, but the internet streamers can't. There's even distribution questions. If you're distributing via cable, there are no caps or additional costs on the service. That's not true for many internet subscribers. There are intellectual property preferences, and I'll come to that soon, that that give advantages to producers where they're Canadian, and you don't see that for the foreign producers. And we've seen even protections from trade agreements that have that benefit the Canadian players that don't benefit the internet streamers. Now, none of this is to necessarily take issue with those policies. It's only to note that the claim that we're dealing with an unlevel playing field and this legislation would level it simply by requiring new payments, I think is a real misread of what the situation is really like in terms of both the benefits and obligations that come in the regulated environment in Canada. It isn't just a level playing field that is one of the foundational arguments that Minister Gibo has raised. He's also painted a picture of Canadian content or production industry that's in crisis that needs this revenue. It will lose out on a billion dollars unless the government steps in with regulation, suggesting that there are real problems in terms of production of film and television in Canada. I think, once again, the, the reality is quite different from the picture that the minister has been painting. This legislation will also generate investment in Canada and create jobs, two important drivers for reopening creative industries and ensuring their sustainability. There, this, is, this is no small feat when we consider that the broadcasting, audiovisual, music and interactive media sectors contribute $20.4 billion to Canada's GDP and represent more than 160,000 jobs. The reality is that the overall financing picture shows an industry that has had record amounts of investment in film and television production, with the total amount nearly doubling over the past decade. In fact, certified Canadian content, those Canadian stories, has also grown in recent years, with the top two years for certified Canadian content television production occurring over the past three years. In fact, even as there's an emphasis at times on French language production, it is worth noting that the biggest year for production of French language content, Canadian content over the past decade, took place just last year. We see similar kinds of data at the provincial level. For example, Ontario Creates, which is the government of Ontario Agency for Cultural Creation, recently touted a record-breaking year for Ontario's film and television production sector, citing more than $2 billion in production spending. And it's worth noting that of that $2.1 billion, there was a near-even split between the domestic and foreign service productions. In other words, certified CanCon and productions in Canada that are not necessarily certified as Canadian content, but nevertheless are a great way to ensure that uh, there's jobs and economic activity taking place. You don't have to take my word for it. Carleton professor Dwayne Winsek uh, recently released his annual review of the network economy in Canada and drawing from multiple sources found that film and television production investment in Canada has continuously increased for two decades. Most recently driven, he says, by massive investments from streaming services such as Netflix and Amazon Prime. 
In fact, just last year, CRTC Chair Ian Scott said that Netflix is probably the single biggest contributor to the Canadian production sector today. Leaving aside arguments that the law is even necessary, given the actual state of film and television production in Canada and a closer look at, at what the current regulatory situation actually looks like from a so-called level playing field perspective. Recognize there are some that would say, well, how can it hurt? The law hasn't been updated in a very long time. Isn't it useful to do so? And I think, yes, the answer is that it is useful to ensure that the law remains relevant. But as I've tried to point out repeatedly in a whole series of different posts as part of this series, there are real harms that I think come with this particular legislation. I want to focus on several First, talking about how I think this law, or at least the bill, is far broader than many realize and certainly broader than the minister has claimed. I'll then touch a little bit on the cost I think that it brings from a Canadian ownership perspective, Canadian jobs, and Canadian ownership of intellectual property, and then talk a little bit about what it actually does require to, I think, demonstrate that the reach is broad, but so too are some of the obligations that are associated with this bill. Why don't we start? with the issue of the guardrails or limitations that are built into the bill, or at least the government claims are built into the bill. Here's what Minister Gibbo told the House of Commons. Bear in mind, we are imposing a number of guardrails. As I said earlier, user-generated content, news content, and video games will not be subject to the new regulations. Furthermore, entities will need to reach a significant economic threshold before any regulation can be imposed. Let me start first with where the minister left off, this issue of there being a significant economic threshold before any regulation can be imposed. With all due respect, this is simply false. There is no specific economic threshold that is established by the bill. The starting point is that all internet streaming services carried on in whole or in part in Canada are subject to Canadian regulation. In other words, if you have Canadian subscribers, the law applies regardless of where the service is located. Now, Guibault is presumably referring to the fact that the law gives the CRTC the power to exempt services from regulation. And it is true that the CRTC could establish some thresholds for regulation once the bill is enacted. But that's not the same as claiming that the law contains significant economic thresholds. In fact, it doesn't. Moreover, I think it's fair to say that the CRTC will not limit its regulatory approach to companies that generate large revenues in Canada. Ministers raised that kind of language, whatever that specifically means. In fact, in order for the CRTC to determine who might be exempt, it's likely to require that even smaller foreign services register with the regulator and provide it with confidential subscriber information, revenue data, frankly, whatever information they specifically want. Now, that creates a lot of uncertainty as to who might be caught by the regulation, which I think is sure to have an impact on the market. Internet streaming services thinking about the Canadian market may put some of those plans on hold until they have some visibility over what they face from a regulatory perspective, which would lead to less competition and less choice for Canadians. In fact, should the CRTC even establish an economic threshold? As I say, it's not in the bill, but the regulator could do that. Even that could have an unexpected impact. For example, if it establishes a high threshold that limits it to a handful of large predominantly U.S.-based streaming services, it invites the possibility of a trade challenge saying that it's targeting U.S. companies. If it's a low threshold that they establish as the standard, foreign services might avoid the Canadian market altogether given the regulatory costs. In fact, there would be a disincentive for becoming too big in Canada because suddenly you would become much costlier to operate here. But it's not just this issue of economic thresholds that the minister cites when he talks about economic guardrails. He mentioned in that quote that there are exceptions for user-generated content, news content, and video games, and none of those are subject to the regulations. Now, the user-generated content side is actually complicated. There is a reference to it in the bill, but it 
covers the individuals and covers that content. It doesn't necessarily cover the sites themselves. So YouTube, for example, is covered insofar or would be covered insofar as it limits what it does exclusively to this user-generated content. Once it moves outside of that realm and it does have subscription services, then suddenly it is still caught by this legislation. So there won't be many sites or services that actually are excluded. On the video game side, there once again is actually no reference to this in the legislation. It's at this stage just an assurance by the government that it will exempt video games by way of a policy direction that it provides to the CRTC telling, in effect, the regulator exclude video games. So that remains to, we, remain, we still don't have that, but government has said that's what they intend to do. On the issue of news content, which I think harkens back to controversy earlier this year when Minister Guy Beau didn't seem particularly troubled by the notion of licensing news organizations and ultimately had to walk some of those comments back. He says that news content is excluded from the regulations, but once again, that, that simply isn't so. The way the legislation approaches the issue is one that I would argue that online news sites and services that offer news in video or audio format are quite clearly at this stage captured by the bill. Online undertakings, so the internet services, are defined in the bill as, and I'll quote, an undertaking for the transmission or retransmission of programs over the internet for reception by the public by means of a broadcasting receiving apparatus. What matters in there is this idea of transmission or retransmission of programs over the internet, and a program over the internet is defined broadly enough in the Broadcasting Act, certainly to include news. There's no specific exclusion at all. In fact, so long as the news is not predominantly alphanumeric text, just basic text, it's treated as a program under the Act, and online undertakings that transmit those programs are subject to regulation. And in fact, the CRTC has long played a role in regulating news of conventional broadcasters with codes of conduct and other examinations to ensure that they meet their news broadcast obligations. Now, the department, I think, recognizes that, but they use language that might leave some with uh, a misimpression of the state of the bill. So there's a frequently asked questions page in FAQ that says that news sites that do not predominantly display text are not captured by the Act. Of course, what it doesn't say is that those same news sites and organizations that rely on audio and video will be regulated by the Act. Now, the FAQ also says that the bill doesn't license news organizations. That's true. There's no license requirement, but that's because there's no license requirement for un online undertakings. Those entities, including video news sites, will be required to register with the CRTC, provide confidential business information, and potentially required to meet discoverability requirements that I'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. The potential scope of news sites regulation under this bill is vast. It covers everything from sites like The Rebel to podcast networks like Canada Land. In fact, it even might apply to foreign sites, raising the possibility that sites with considerable audio and video and significant Canadian subscribers, say like the New York Times, could be captured as well. Now, once again, as with economic thresholds, it'll actually be up to the CRTC to decide what the obligations are. But as it stands, when the minister says news is excluded, it's simply not true. Now, unsurprisingly for a bill that, that directly implicates the cultural sector, much of the focus is about cultural sovereignty and safeguarding Canadian stories, Canadian values. The minister is very blunt about it. Here's what he said in a press conference on the issue. This legislation is about our cultural sovereignty. So the minister says that the legislation is all about cultural sovereignty. But when you take a closer look at the Canadian ownership rules, at the role the Canadians play in their own programming, Indeed, when you take a look at Canadian ownership of intellectual property, this feels more like a surrender of Canadian sovereignty than it does protecting Canadian sovereignty. Let's start with Canadian ownership. The current Broadcasting Act begins with a declaration of Canadian broadcast policy. It identifies at least 20 different priorities that range from access to both English and French programming to the role of the CBC. At the very top of the list is Canadian ownership, affirming, and I quote, the Canadian broadcasting system shall be effectively owned and controlled by Canadians. 
Yet Bill C-10 discards the provision and removes any reference to Canadian ownership and control in the law. Let me repeat that. The long-standing provision that at the very top of our policy says that the Broadcasting Act shall be effectively owned and controlled by Canadians is being removed as part of Bill C-10. And the government's respond to concerns about this change in approach by arguing that the basis for con- Canadian ownership requirements don't come from the policy declaration, but rather from a long-standing government direction that non-Canadians are ineligible to hold broadcasting licenses. That direction has been implemented multiple times by the CRTC. However, the direction could easily change with a different government. And if the CRTC were asked to re-examine the approach, it would have to look at whatever the Broadcasting Act said. And if it's got no reference to Canadian ownership, it won't form part of the guidance. In fact, it's pretty clear that there is a link between the change in policy and the possibility of foreign ownership of the Canadian broadcasting system. I've actually argued in a Globe and Mail column that This bill marks the beginning of the end of Canadian ownership and control requirements, uh, both on legal and procedural grounds that I've just described, but also, I think, in terms of how the market will evolve. I mean, what's happening is that the government is effectively acknowledging that if it mandates foreign streaming services to be part of and contribute to the Canadian broadcast system, well, then that system can no longer be effectively owned and controlled by Canadians. You, You can't have your cake and eat it, too. Now, the minister argues that removing the policy is immaterial because, well, licensing requirements would still apply to broadcasters and they can be used to ensure that they remain in Canadian hands. But I think the obvious trajectory of the Canadian of the new Canadian system under this bill is to shift away from the licensing system. In fact, I think it's those same licensed broadcasters that will increasingly look at the unlicensed internet world that's free from foreign investment restrictions and conclude that they prefer the unlicensed system. We're really creating a a dual structure with respect to this bill. In fact, there are real risks here, I think, that as the Canadian market features increasingly prominent foreign ownership presence, both from these large foreign streamers and potentially foreign companies buying Canadian-based streamers that also will fall outside of these rules, more and more, as I say, of these Canadian streamers will become foreign controlled and the largest broadcasters will simply say, we may be better off either just giving up our license and being able to compete so that we have full global access to capital, or they're going to start resurfacing old arguments, again, referencing things like a level playing field and claim that the license system can't compete against an unlicensed domestic and foreign streaming service market that, as I say, has access to capital from anyone in the world. So I think it's unquestionably the case, it's clear, it's removed from the bill that the ownership requirements have been put at risk under this legislation. Now, somewhat surprisingly, the bill also downgrades the role of Canadian creators and performers in their own productions. Now, the government has said that this bill will create more opportunities for creators and talent in the production sector, but it's notable that they've made a change again on the policy side when it speaks to the role or use of Canadian creative talent. The Broadcasting Act today, as I mentioned, features a series of policies, and one of the policies speaks to the use of Canadian creative talent. It says, each broadcasting undertaking shall make, and I'll, this is I'm emphasize it here, maximum use and in no case less than predominant use of Canadian creative and other resources in the creation and presentation of programming. It goes on to say that unless the nature of the service provided by the undertaking is specialized content, so it renders that impracticable, In those cases, the undertaking shall make the greatest practicable use of those resources. So in other words, to the extent, maximum extent possible, you should be using Canadian creative talent. That's been replaced in Bill C-10 by dropping the maximum or predominant use standard. Instead, it simply says that each broadcasting undertaking shall make use of Canadian creative and other resources in the creation of and presentation of programming to the extent that is appropriate for the nature of the undertaking. That's a significant drop in the standard or expectation of the role that Canadians play. Now, presumably that change was needed to once again give the expansive regulatory approach that's taken in Bill C-10 
effect because if you're going to include all of these players including potentially as i mentioned earlier things like news sites and podcasters it may no longer be possible to require that canadian creative talent meets that high threshold but that's part of the price that's being paid and as i say to suggest that somehow this is protecting canadian sovereignty when it's actually reducing the role of canadians ought to at minimum be acknowledged now, thirdly, there's also the issue of the risks to Canadian ownership of intellectual property. Now, there's, there is no reference to intellectual property, to IP in the bill or any discussion of it in some of the departmental materials, other than a, a background document that referenced IP, suggesting that it could be included in a policy direction to the CRTC. There really isn't any prioritization of intellectual property in the bill itself. That said, I think if you take a careful look at the implications of this bill. I think there is a real risk that we are going to find Canadian IP ownership downplayed as part of the legislation. We've long had in Canada policies that have prioritized domestic IP ownership and precluded foreign companies from producing and owning fully financed Canadian content. As a result, revivals of Canadian programs such as Trailer Park Boys on Netflix or Kids in the Hall on Amazon wouldn't meet the Canadian content qualification requirements where those companies are the sole funders and producers. Now, the problem with Bill C-10 is that since no production fully financed and owned by a foreign entity can be certified as Canadian content, and the government is seeking to mandate such financing, the Canadian content rules are going to have to change. If those changes mean removing the IP ownership link between, say, tax credits and subsidies, and you find that the well-financed foreign streamers, the companies like the Netflix and the Amazons and the Disneys, are allowed to fully finance and own Canadian content, the likely outcome is that they're going to outbid Canadian producers for the very best content. Now, what's the end result of bringing them into this system and being effectively forced to de-emphasize Canadian IP ownership? Well, it's simply that in the end of the day, we're going to find that the very best Canadian IP is owned by the foreign streaming services, not by Canadians. A direct reversal of the long-standing Canadian policy that has actually tried to achieve the opposite result. Now, finally, let's talk a bit about what is required of internet streamers and those captured by Bill C-10. There are a lot of things I could focus on. Confidential data disclosure requirements is the subject of one post that I think raises some pretty significant issues. But I want to focus on three in particular as part of this podcast. First, the issue of registration. Secondly, the discoverability requirements. And third, the reason, I think, for many that this legislation exists, the mandated payments. Let's start with registration. In, in terms of exactly how this will happen, we, are, we will be asking the CRTC to hold hearings and, and to determine the, the, the exact mechanisms by which you were, uh, you were asking about funds uh, in your question. So we will be asking the CRTC to determine the, the exact ways this, this, will, this will take place. So the government has emphasized that there is no licensing requirement for internet services. They've repeat that in the House. They've mentioned it now many times uh, as well as, as part of the materials that they've provided, stating that the bill in no way prevents online streaming services from operating in Canada or requires them to be licensed. And in fact, there is a very clear exemption that a person may carry on an, an online undertaking without a license and without being so exempt. There is no licensing requirement. That's true. But what is, I think, also true is when you take a look at what is required of those online undertakings, that in many respects is a distinction without a difference. The combination of registration, widespread regulations, and conditions that are applied not only to the sector as a whole, but quite remarkably can be targeted to individual companies, making very specific requirements about what individual companies might have to do in terms of data disclosure, in terms of the kinds of payments they might make. Make this look, I think, for all intents and purposes, like a licensing system. I mean, it's got all the hallmarks of a license, even if there isn't a specific requirement for license. Now, where do, do, do some of these new powers and requirements come from? Section 10, sub 1, 
sub I, uh, if you want to get specific, gives the CRTC the power to establish regulations that could require all broadcast undertakings, including online undertakings, the internet services, to register with the commission. I've already talked about how broadly the bill defi defines its scope, including smaller streaming services, video news sites, podcasters, and the like. All of those entities would be required to register as part of the system. But it goes well beyond just registration. The CRTC can establish registration fees. It can uh, conduct audits. In fact, it can establish a whole host of regulations, all of them backed by the prospect of stiff penalties and administrative and monetary penalties, AMPS, for contravening the regulations. And those can run into the millions of dollars. And so it's true there isn't licensing. But when you've got a regulation system that includes registration, mandated audits, and CanCon conditions that are all backed by millions in potential penalties for failing to comply, that looks pretty broad, I think, in terms of uh, what's covered and, and, and what would be expected. Indeed, there's also, in addition to the regulations, there are a series of conditions that are attached to this. The conditions that can be included include things like the proportion of programs to be broadcast that are Canadian, Carriage even of emergency messages, which you find on broadcasters in theory, the same requirements could be made of streaming services, providing the CRTC with information on ownership and governance, providing it with really any information it requires, including financial or commercial information, programming information, expenditure information, pretty much anything the CRTC wants to know, they can require others to disclose. And that's, I think, for some services, going to provide a strong incentive to try to avoid the Canadian market as much as they can. Further, and I alluded to this just a moment ago, the bill actually gives the CRTC the power to target individual services. So it can make an order applying its rules not only to a class of services, so broadly a whole series of services, but to a particular person carrying on a broadcasting undertaking. And so if you're Netflix or Disney or Amazon Prime, you may find yourself facing very specific conditions associated with the requirements to act. Now, secondly, there are also discoverability requirements. Uh, when Minister Gubbo was in the House of Commons, he talked about his daughter's use of digital services, noting that the bill will allow her not only take advantage of the international offerings that are out there, but to discover Canadian content. And so this idea is one that's been percolating for some time in Canadian cultural debates, this notion that Canadians really want to find Canadian content, but it often gets lost amidst the broad array of content more broadly. And so if only we required these services to promote and make Canadian content more visible, it would be more successful. The term discoverability appears once in the bill. One of the conditions that the CRTC can establish talks about the presentation of programs for selection by the public, including the discoverability of Canadian programs. The term discoverability doesn't appear elsewhere and, and it isn't defined. And so, as with so many of the issues I've been talking about, it will fall to the CRTC to decide what that means and what conditions are imposed on internet services as a result. Now, based on that cultural debate that I referenced a moment ago, it can be expected, I think, that the CRTC will be urged, at least, to require services like Disney Plus or Netflix to effectively override their algorithms that identify what they think their subscribers are likely to want to see by instead actively promoting Canadian content, regardless of the subscriber's preferred content. I argue in a post that this discoverability issue is, quite frankly, simply unnecessary. The Broadcasting and Telecommunications Legislative Review Panel, the so-called Yale Report, went looking for evidence of discoverability problem and wasn't really able to find very much. Indeed, I'd argue that if you fire up your Netflix right now, it isn't very hard to discover Canadian content. I wrote about the issue about a year ago and created a fresh Netflix account to see whether I could find Canadian programming and if the Netflix algorithm would adjust to what it thought were my interests. The reality is that discovering Canadian content on Netflix only requires typing Canada into the search box. And immediately you get a whole host of choices, some of which is certified Canadian content, other of which is not. But that's for another debate as to whether or not certified Canadian content really does reflect Canadian stories. Or is it more of an exercise that preserves certain jobs and roles and doesn't necessarily account for all the things that one might ascribe to from a Canadian perspective? Now, it seems to me that 
we've seen great discoverability successes of Canadian programs on services like Netflix, such as Schitt's Creek and Working Moms. And I think the reason for that is that it is in the interests of services like Netflix or Disney or Amazon, any of these services that are out there competing actively for subscribers, to ensure that they provide service subscribers with the content they're looking for. They've got no reason to make it hard to discover programs that their subscribers want to watch. In fact, it's the opposite. In a very competitive market where subscribers can cancel at any time, for services like Netflix, they've got to ensure that subscribers are finding the content they want to watch or they risk losing them as customers. For many years, the Canadian cultural sector has claimed that Canadians want to access Canadian programming. It's just hard to find. And it may have been true in the earlier broadcast era where some of that content was buried at less popular times simply as an exercise in meeting regulatory obligations. But when you're in a competitive environment with no long-term commitment, it's in the company's interest to ensure that the content is discoverable and that Canadians, as I say, can find it if that's what they're looking for. This is a condition that is simply unnecessary given the realities of how the market functions. Now, finally, let's turn to what is really the centerpiece in many ways of the legislation at the end of the day, and that is the mandated payments that will be required of foreign streaming services. We're not asking these companies to, to do things that they're not already doing. They are investing in Canada. What we're doing is we're putting a regulatory framework on how those investments should be made in light of things we're already asking from, from Canadian broadcasters. So we're not asking them to do things they aren't already doing. Now on this front, he has claimed that this legislation will result in a billion dollars a year coming into the sector by 2023 in new funding. I've written a post that argues that those claims are massively exaggerated in terms of what the actual likely funding impact is going to be. Now, the mandatory payment system is established in Section 11.1, Sub 1 of Bill C-10. It says that the commission, the CRTC, may make regulations respecting expenditures to be made by persons carrying on broadcasting undertakings for several purposes. And those include developing, financing, producing, or promoting Canadian audio or audiovisual programming. The government's approach, like so many of these other issues, is to leave the precise issues to the CRTC to decide who contributes, how they contribute, and how much they contribute. So when you combine that, of course, with the power to target individual companies and require disclosure of detailed confidential information, that vests really unprecedented power in the hands of the regulator. Now, despite the fact that the CRTC is the one that will determine the actual amounts, Minister Gibault clearly has a number in mind. As I mentioned, he's talked about a billion in new revenues. When he launched the bill, the number that was being used was $830 million. But pretty soon, the minister was claiming that it was nearly a billion. And then in the House, he actually said it's more than a billion. Because if nothing is done by 2023, Canadian productions and Canadian artists will miss out on a billion dollars. Minister has been asked by members of parliament in, in one committee appearance for how he arrived at that number. He promised to provide the math, but at least to my knowledge, at least publicly, that hasn't happened yet. It does appear, though, that his number is basically just a rough estimate of the Canadian revenues from services such as Netflix with mandated payments that could run as high as 30 percent of those revenues. So, for example, in the case of Netflix, its publicly stated revenues in Canada in 2019 for at least the first nine months were $780 million. That's almost a billion, $975 million for the entire year. So at 30%, Netflix would be contributing almost $300 million, or about 30% of the number that the minister is projecting. Now, that unquestionably will sound very tempting to many, but it isn't the entire story. First off, it isn't a billion dollars of new money. In the case of Netflix, it committed in 2017 to spend $500 million on productions in Canada over the following five years. A year later, the company said it was on track to exceed that commitment. So in other words, Netflix was already spending hundreds of millions of dollars on production in Canada. And while it's uncertain how the CRTC will mandate the spending, it seems likely that the lion's share of that spending will simply be reallocated money, not new funding. 
I think that's true not just for Netflix, but for many of the other services as well. Second, notwithstanding claims that the money will be coming quickly, that grows to a billion per year by 2023, it's far more likely that the issue will still be the subject of litigation by 2023 without any new money at that stage. Anyone who follows the CRTC knows that it takes years for processes to unfold with public comments, lengthy hearings, an initial decision, applications to review and vary the decision, possibly judicial reviews, cabinet appeals, potential judicial appeals of that. And if any of those appeals are successful, the CRTC would be required to re-examine the issue. Guibault told the press in his opening press conference he was going to mandate that the CRTC come back with an answer in nine months. And that would require a real rocket docket on the part of the CRTC, but it, of course, wouldn't be the end of the story because you can't mandate out the various appellate processes that exist. The best, I suppose, the minister could hope for is to create some urgency at the CRTC and say that they'd like to see them come to a, an initial conclusion by that time. But it would still be subject to all the various uh, recourses that are otherwise available. In fact, I'd argue that given the timelines, Bill C-10 could actually reduce spending in the short to medium term. Since companies that invest in the Canadian market won't know whether their current spending meets the regulatory requirements or there's going to be hundreds of millions more required Many could delay Canadian productions until there's more certainty, which would lead to lost jobs during what is obviously a particularly difficult time right now for the industry. Now, others may avoid the Canadian market altogether and simply say that the costs of operating here are simply too high. So you may find that there are streaming companies that have content and rather than trying to market themselves directly to Canadian subscribers. They choose instead to license their content to existing Canadian providers and thereby avoid dealing with the CRTC at all. In doing so, avoid also these mandated contributions. Now, I think the government could have generated more revenue for Canadian production simply by using its tax power to generate more tax revenues. Instead, what it's done with this payment system is really expand a cross-subsidy model that's now overseen by the CRTC that is unlikely to generate anywhere near the billion dollars per year in new money that Minister Guibault has claimed. A word on what comes next. For the purposes of my blog series, there will be several more posts this week that take a look at the trade ramifications and a couple of other issues before it wraps up before the holidays. More broadly, though, I think as we enter into the hearings that will come early next year, I think the irony behind all of this is that there are viable alternatives that would allow the government to maintain longstanding Canadian ownership principles, to maintain many of the benefits uh, that come from prioritizing Canadians in their productions and Canadian IP, uh, and still ensure, even with all of those policies in place, that Canada benefits from the presence of foreign streaming services beyond the fact that, of course, many consumers clearly really like them, given that their subscriber numbers are very high. The government could guarantee more revenues for Canadian productions from companies such as Netflix through tax policy including mandating the collection and remission of sales taxes, something that it recently announced it plans to do. It could use the existing tax credit policies that are an essential part of the production sector to mandate that recipients meet new requirements on promotion. It could also adjust some of the current eligibility requirements that would make investment by foreign services in Canada even more attractive. In other words, rather than shoehorning internet streamers into the broadcast system, despite the fact that there are obvious differences and advantages for some of the existing broadcasters within that system. And by doing so, create a whole series of negative repercussions. I think it could, indeed, I think it should rethink the evident blunders that exist in this latest reform bill. Staying on the current path seems to generate some support from some parties in the House, but it spells the end of Canadian ownership and control of the broadcasting system as a policy priority, undermines the role of Canadians in their own productions, increases consumer costs, reduces choice, and at the end of the day, doesn't generate anywhere near the kind of bang for the buck that the minister has been talking about. That's my case for why Bill C-10 needs a significant rethink. This is the last podcast for 2020. It's been a difficult year for so many. And I think many, of course, will be happy to see the end of, of this year and are looking forward to a better one next. 
My thanks to everyone who listens, responds, reacts, and of course participates with so many speakers from across the spectrum who've participated and come on the podcast this year. It's great fun to do, and I hope you have a fun time listening. I'll be back next year with a whole series of new episodes starting in January. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at lawbitespod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Mm-hmm.